Oh, dear Rose, and today we're going to be talking about Hans Rockmacher in Praise of Shadows, the Counter Enlightenment, Lax, uh, the Avo Andrex Bridge over the Drina. All of these texts, all of these works, there's this interesting um, theme in all of them where we find um, the fullness of life, where we find beauty, where we find a sense of transcendence, meaning, these higher principles of life we tend to experience. Um, in a dimly lit room that is not totally dark, but entails shadows that bring out the architecture and that somehow add to the aesthetic experience of the food. If we're, if we're talking um, in praise of shadows by uh, Tensaki, um, which, you know, that book will start off um, describing the experience of even going to the restroom and how one can view the, 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 the moon there and how the particular setting of the cooling, the cool... The, the fact that you have luster um, in certain aged colors, he'll talk about the particular aesthetic experience of something that's aged. He'll talk about the balance of how um, actors and different people will conceal themselves with their outfit and how this somehow brings out the beauty of those individuals. So there's this interesting play where he's very concerned about how in Western um, ac architecture and buildings, it's just everything is illuminated, everything is bright, and how something is lost when everything is bright and illuminated. And in fact, um, you need shadows. Shadows will add something to a room. Um, dimly lit, he'll talk about some of the dimly lit restaurants that he would visit where something in the experience of going there was lost once the electric lights um, were were introduced. He, he'll also talk about the aesthetic experience of, say, the fan and bringing in an electric fan and how that can kind of ruin the ceiling if this object is there. He's not necessarily moralizing Eastern ways of doing things as better or that Japanese tradition is better, but he also is concerned that there might be just this assumption to think that Western increases in artificial lighting or just adding a fan, all of these things are necessarily better. There's something that's more tragic in his thinking, um, trade-offs of competing goods. And I was inspired to, uh, to, to, to think about this because of the course that uh, the wonderful Daniel Zaruba is doing at the Halcon Guild with uh, the fantastic Johannes. But there's this interesting tension. Uh, if there, now, what's, in, what's interesting about shadows is shadows is not pure darkness. It's a relationship. Shadows only exist where there's some light, um, if there, but not too much light. And so shadows can be lost just like that um, if, uh, if the right balance is not struck. So there's this interesting balance that has to be struck between light and dark in order for the proper, meaningful, aesthetic, and full experience of the room, of a space to be, um, to be experienced. Now, this alludes to a kind of mystery we see in a book um, like the bridge, um, the, the bridge Over the Drina, I believe, with Avo Andrek, where he talks about Fatima, the beautiful Fatima, and everyone in town wants to be around the beautiful Fatima. And she's veiled, and you have this sense that people want to remove the veil and see her um, f fully naked uh, to, 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 because they're driven by lust. But there's this sense in which the veil is necessary for her beauty. Something happens where Fatima dies, um, and the veil is removed. They find her body on, on the shore, and it's unclothed, and the men are horrified. And there's this scene where they're blowing the smoke away from the cigarette because there's something that has haunted them. So what's, what's interesting is if you have a pure nature, naked body is undesirable. Uh, there has to be life in there. And that life, in a way, is veiled by the body. So you have this interesting double action where the veil um, is kind of what creates the desire. But if you get to the object of desire, but that object that you get to is not veiling anything in of itself. If you remove the clothes from a body, but the body doesn't have life in it, so there's not something veiled, then it becomes a horror, actually. It becomes something um, terrible. And there are many writers and thinkers who, des who describe the mystery of the veil. We see it in religious thought, in Judaism, in the temple, in uh, the, this notion that the veil, that God is behind the veil, that if you see God unveiled, it will kill you. And the veil is a necessary component for the mystery so that we can handle it, handle it, but what is a veil? Um, if something is too veiled, then you don't know it's there. And thus the thing is not a veil, it's just kind of a wall. It, it's just an object. There's nothing behind it. So a veil only works if you know that the, that something is being veiled and if there's something behind it. And a veil 
um, suggests that there's a relation with the thing behind the veil, uh, that we're on this side of the veil in the temple, but we're trying to relate to the God on the other side of the veil. So there's a sense in which the veil is transparent, although of course it is not transparent, you can't see through it, but there's a sense in which we operate through the veil. But there has to be a veil for us to operate through it. So there has to be this interesting balance between what is visible and what is invisible, what is seen and what is not seen in the same way that there has to be a balance between light and shadow to get the right aesthetic experience in the room. And of course, shadows are instantly destroyed by light. So if you get the right balance in the room following in praise of shadows, it could be lost in a heartbeat. In the same way that if you a veil can be torn quite easily, a veil can be removed and then the mystery is gone, then the meaning is gone. And so all of these balances are so easily lost and that's i think that's that's important um if we follow the thinking of say a hans ruckmacher in art um a single a painting all the elements have to be perfect if i were to come up to the mona lisa and take a paint brush and draw a big red stripe through the center of it the painting would fail it would no longer work um, all the parts, all the, the dashes, all the little colors, all the dots, whatever, they all have to come together, the shapes, they all have to come together perfectly for the painter, the painting to operate, for the painting to work. Um, and for Mr. Ruckmacher, great paintings always point away from themselves toward the metaphysical, that all paintings um, are not merely representations, they're not photographs per se, they are representations of human perceptions, they are of human experience. But that is cannot be located in the painting, and yet the painting is impossible without it, and the painting points at it. The painting points at these values um, when the painting is a successful balance of all the elements. But if it's not a successful balance of all these elements, then it does not so point. In the same way that a good symbol in, say, poetry or literature works... So that every time you say, see the cat in the story, you think about evil, if the cat represents evil, for example, and yet never is it directly said that the cat is evil, because if that if, if the author does that, the um, the phenomenon is too, um, is too upfront, it's not discreet enough to be a successful symbol, so something has to be hiding. And so in literature, for symbolism and these kind of deeper meanings to work, they, it has to be hidden, it has to, the story, it can't be poured in from the top, is the phrase Dr. Wilson would always say. The, the symbolism and the meaning have to be integrated into the story, and the story has to just be a story. It can't feel like the story is in service of the symbols, it has to just be a story. But if the story is done well, then the elements come together in a manner that point to something beyond themselves but there has to be this perfect balance of literary and aesthetic elements in the same way that the in the painting the shapes and the colors all have to be perfectly balanced to come together so if there's a perfect balance in the painting it points to metaphysical dimensions that are not present um, if the veil is in the temple in Judaism then it points to the God that is not present and yet present in that very absence ergo lack which is a theme in Reconstructing A as A in the, the, with the series with Cadell and Ebert and Mr. Adlin and Mr. J and the work also with Jockin and um, Javier. And, and likewise, the, the, um, there has to be this balance for the woman uh, in Fatima in the bridge over the, 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 the Drina, where she has to be veiled to be attracted, but if she's unveiled in a way of which there's no longer life in the body, then it's a horror as opposed to an experience of beauty. And there has to be a balance of elements for the room in, in praise of shadows to have this very special aesthetic experience. What is very interesting in all of these examples, and, 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 and also, not the, and, and lastly, we can be thinking about, you could bring up the counter-enlightenment with the, the, the Humes and the, 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 uh, the Coes and these, the Scottish Enlightenment, these different people, who had this understanding that reason, rationality, only worked if it wasn't all there was. If there was, it had to work in concert of tradition, but there was something about rationality that naturally attacked tradition, but if it did that, it would not have a foundation to itself and thus be, 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 negate itself. It would destroy itself, and so rationality only worked if it found itself balancing with tradition or other non-rational um, entities like experience or emotion or in the truism of the rational series we'll say that rationality always needs truth and the truth cannot be reduced to rationality and there has to be a balance between truth and rational in order for rationality to actually get us to function and not become a force of terror or autonomous rationality as discussed in the paper Deconstructing Common Life. And so in the counter-enlightenment we see this idea that there has to be a balance 
balance between rationality and say experience and truth and non-rationality and community and relationships. And if this um, balance is not struck, then rationality will become a source of totalitarianism. And this is explored also in say the work of a Fon Benjamin Fondane. Um, so all of these things are, are very interesting because you see um, where, the, where, the, where the meaningful, the metaphysical, the beautiful, the aesthetic, the, the, um, the properly ordered epistemology, all of these things are dealing with these interesting balances that are so easily broken up and that are so fragile. These, these kind of mysteries, these things that have to be rightly ordered, like um, you're cooking something and all the ingredients have to be in the right place at the right time. And if they're not so done, then the, the dish is terrible. And there seems to be, um, the, if we go back to In Praise of Shadows, the tendency the West tends to illuminate everything. There tends to be artificial lighting everywhere. Well, going to the concerns of the counter enlightenment, there's a tendency of Westerners to make everything rational, to make, to put everything in rational terms, to have no space for the non-rational as in um, Western architecture, there's no space for the shadow. Um, the, and also too, in say the sexual revolution, there's, there can be no space for the veil, for the, the putting off. There can be a sense that if sexuality and lust are fully realized and able to do and, um, and to express themselves however they want, then that's where they're going to find fulfillment. But if we follow someone like a Freud, there's an understanding that um, we, we have to find a balance between um, releases and givens, to use the language from belonging again. We, have to, um, we can't just have totally free sexuality because then we would experience the real, as Lacan um, says, without any... Um, inter-mediating um, um, experiences in the real would terrify us and overwhelm us. Um, uh, so there has to be a way of balancing sexuality and expressing sexuality in a manner where there are still quote-unquote veils, there are still levels of repressants uh, because if we if, because the human psyche that has no repression at all will go mad and will completely collapse under the real that it will be exposed to because there will be no repressants or givens to hold back any of the real so there has to be a balance between givens and releases some mysterious balance um and yet it's the nature of releases to dominate and destroy givens as it's the nature of rationality to destroy non-rationality as it is the nature of light to destroy shadow as it is the nature of the human being to remove all veils. Um, and, and that tension that, that has to be resisted, it must be resisted by all means. Um, because, because if we do not, and these balances are lost, of which are inherently tense balances and tend to destroy themselves as light tends to consume shadow and so on and so on, um, well, then we're going to lose meaning. We're going to lose the metaphysical. We're going to lead, lose formal principles. We're going to lose beauty. We're going to lose um, these, these things that call out to us and point to something beyond ourselves. And if we have no sense of something beyond ourselves or something bigger than ourselves or something that's worth living for, well then, yeah, we're going to have nihilism unleashed upon the world, the bad nihilism that leads to the meaning crisis and mental um, illness and, and all of these different things. Um, and, and we won't be able to look at a painting and have a sense of some sort of um, metaphysical dimension behind the painting that the painting is, is pointing to. All of this I will discuss under the umbrella of conditionality and, and I'll talk about aesthetic epistemology. All of this, um, all of these thinkers, all of these works are suggesting that there is a certain conditionality that has to be met for human life to be optimal, for humans to thrive. There has to be a certain way the building is designed and thus meet a certain condition so that shadows balance with light. Where in relationships there has to be a certain balance between veils and unveilings so that human beings maintain their beauty and our desire for them. There has to be a certain balance um, between uh, the artistic elements of a work so that it can point to uh, higher dimensions than just the painting so that images are something more than that, in the same way that there, there has to be a, a balance uh, where we do our best to be rational and to be logical, but we also understand that if we don't ultimately ascribe to something beyond the rational, then the rational will not have a foundation for itself. Um, truth, a uh, rationality without truth is autonomous rationality, and that becomes self-devouring, as hopefully all the works and the truths of the rational have, um, have argued. So there's this um, way we need to condition rationality, way we need to condition our our eyes to see the world around us artistically, ways we need to condition our desire so that we don't uh, rip off and destroy our, all veils and thus destroy our desire. And there needs to be a way to condition 
uh, the way that we put light in our lives um, so that we don't miss out on shadow because without shadow, then everything is just, uh, he'll describe going into rooms and they're so hot now because of so much artificial lighting. And there's a kind of a dreariness and a sort of misery and there's a flatness and a, a, a smoothness that is off-putting and robotic in, and that lacks humanity. Um, all of these works are pointing to this great importance and great role of conditionality of balance, of dialectical thinking. And all of them are also suggesting this third metaphysical category that will lack, which is these present absences. And that, that comes from Mr. Jockin on Aristotle. And it's the idea that the veil, the experience of the veil is needed in, in, or points to the experience of the veil creates a sense of lack. And that lack and being toward lack seems to be really important for human beings to thrive. And so it goes with the experience of rationality, which lacks a truth and thus screen, you know, says to us the need for truth. So it goes when we look at a painting and know and have this feeling that is pointing beyond itself, but that beyond is lacking from the painting, but only believable because of the painting of which in viewing we can sense the lack and I can, can continue to keep going. But this third metaphysical category, um, which is not being, but it's also not nothing, but it's a but it's a present absence. It's a way in which nothing is being to us in a sense. Lack, I think, is extraordinarily critical to um, to understand if we're going to, in fact, um, reach, establish, entertain, and consider a new ontology, which would correspondingly give rise to a new epistemology, of which seems utterly critical and necessary if we are to survive and to overcome the meaning crisis of which, again, I stress is a sign of hope because it means that we are not falling back on old, old ways, xenophobia, discrimination, force, so on and so forth, by which to give ourselves meaning. It does mean that we're holding ourselves to higher standards. But if we are to um, not merely endure, but also prevail, as Mr. William Faulkner said in his Nobel Prize speech, I think taking seriously um, the phenomenology, the experience, and the role of lack as um, expressed in these artistic works and philosophical movements that we've discussed will be absolutely necessary. And I think we can do it. And I think we can do it starting now. For more by OG Rose, please visit ogrose.com, Facebook, YouTube, so on and so forth. And thank you so much for your time.